Because, you know, it's said that <clears throat> the way that we view our fathers growing up is the way that we will naturally view God. That could be good. That could be bad. That could be both. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> and so we know, like, across the world um, and even just across this room, some of us had fathers that were like, even as daughters, we're like, man, I, when, I, when I grow up, like, I want to marry a man like that. Mm. But some of us have had fathers where we're like, nope, I don't, nothing, I don't want anything to do with that. Mm. You know what I mean? And then everywhere in between. Some of us didn't even really have a father figure, <clears throat> right? And, and so however we view that relationship can really affect how we view God, how we come to God, or how we don't come to God, mm. right? And it, it's just over and over, we've seen that again and again. And, and so I couldn't help but think about my dad as I was preparing for this lesson. And you guys know my dad is, um, he's going through some, some health challenges, some pretty severe health challenges, actually. Um, and, um, you know, forgetting things and stuff like that. And so, so we're kind of in a weird space. And my, my dad, as I shared a little bit earlier, like, when I think about my dad, I don't, I don't think about him like the way he is now, yeah. right? When I think about my dad, he's still the guy that has forearms that are huge, <laughs> right? He's still the guy that like built both of the houses that we lived in wow. um, with his hands, wow. right? Like wow. I know how to sheetrock and how to put up houses and how to do foundations and how to mud and how to do shingles on our roof. I know how to do these things because of my dad. Right? Um, and, and yeah. like, my dad used to teach me how to play base. He played, he coached baseball. He played baseball. I then played softball. I was terrified. You guys, to this day, I still am deathly afraid of the ball. <laughs> oh. Deathly afraid of the ball. Oh, no. I'm like, don't make me go out there. Like some people are like, don't make me go out there. I'm like, don't make me go out there. <laughs> and yet I played in college, which is just the, the dumbest thing on earth. But like, then I think God would allow me to do that. But um, definitely afraid of the ball. But I played because that was my hang time with my dad. Aww. Like we like. You know, that we couldn't afford to go to camps or to get co private coaches or, you know what I mean? Like all the stuff that all of the Clovis West uh, schools and parents and stuff do. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Call it out. Really you know what I mean? Long. Like, which is fine. We're in a great neighborhood. And if you can do that for your kids, great. Um, you know, my parents just couldn't do that. And so, and it's fine. But you know what they could do? They could rip a radiator out of the engine of a car, Ooh. out of the front of a car, oh. put it up against an old shed and mark it out for, like, that right there was the strike zone area. Just pitch to it. <laughs> oh my God. Wow. And that's how I learned to pitch. Oh my God. You know what I mean? Like, like that's, how, that's how I grew up. You know what I mean? Wow. When I was 10, my, my mom and my mom got me a saddle for our, our pony that we had, a horse. It was free. We were raised below, like, uh, very, very, we had very low means at the time. And, um, and so she went to an auction to go get me a saddle. So <clears throat> my dad and I, we go out to this corral that he had built with his hands and we did the postals ourselves. I was 10 and he, you know, I get on, he puts the saddle on his horse and, and, uh, and he puts me on the horse <clears throat> and the horse starts bucking, right? Oh, I'm 10 no, years old no, and, and I'm no. like, well, and I had been on a pony like bareback since I was two. So I was like, okay, whatever. Okay. But, but like the horse, it threw me, it threw me off. Ooh. And so I land on the ground and my dad just is yelling at me, roll, 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 get out, get out, get out. So I roll underneath the fence and he comes in and he like, he, you know, he gets the horse under control. He investigates the saddle and it turns out that, I mean, it's what we could afford. The saddle cost $10 because that's what we could afford. But my mom wanted me to have a saddle for my birthday. And so, and so, but it had, it was, the saddle had been uh, sewn together with an old coat hanger. And it was poking the horse. And so he was, like, not happy about that. You know what I mean? So, you know, we ditched the saddle. And I went and did bareback for a while. And um, eventually they saved money and they got me a saddle. Which is really cool. But I remember that time in the corral because uh, after he told me to get out, 
he told me to get back on. <laughs> and I love that because my dad, um, my dad, that was a very nourishing time, a very protective time where he protected me from getting hurt, but he also protected me from living in fear. Mm. Wow. wow. You know what I mean? He nourished that part of my heart where I would just go face it and figure it out and get back on and do it, right? And, um, and it's, it's just so, so cool. And we're gonna talk today about the heart of God, which I really saw in that moment with my dad, but we're actually gonna talk about prayer and how, how so much of our prayer life really is dependent on how we view God, right? And so to our, our church has dubbed this year the year of miracles, Yeah. right? It was a miracle that I got back on that horse because I was like, I don't know, but okay, dad's here. Okay, what's the worst that can happen? Okay, I can fall off again, and now this time I could get stepped on. But, you know what I mean? But dad's here, so it's all good. He'll figure it out for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so it was a miracle. But, um, but this year's the year of miracles, and, <clears throat> and I want to talk about prayer because, and I want to actually, this isn't going to be the first time we're going to talk about prayer. We're going to talk about prayer until we get through Luke 11. Okay. Um, but I don't want to talk about just any kind of prayer tonight. I want to talk about prayer, the type of prayer that leads you to action, and those actions create miracles. Mm-hmm. Think about that just for one second. Does that describe your current prayer life? That when you get up from prayer, you act, and your actions lead to miracles because God sees your incredible faith, right? Um, so... Be thinking, what kind of miracles do you need in your life right now? What kind of miracles do you need? Do you need to graduate from college? Do you need to get straight A's? Do you need to get your dream job? Right? Um, Maybe the miracle is more along the lines of you need hope where you've lost it. Right? Um, Or maybe you need to be convinced that you're worth something because you've told yourself that you're not. Or you believe somebody else who's told you that. Maybe the miracle is to be able to forgive or to become, um, to be known as the most generous person in the church. Mm. Maybe the miracle is to start dating. Maybe the miracle is to get married. You got to do one before you do the other. (laughs) Um, Maybe the miracle for you is to see a family member become a true Christian. Or maybe Mm. it's yourself. Maybe the miracle is for you to figure out what it really looks like to be a true Christian. Mm. Maybe that's the miracle, right? But <clears throat> whatever your miracle that's on your heart that you want to see happen, there's one miracle that we cannot deny was the greatest miracle of all, and that was Jesus raising from the dead. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That was the greatest, greatest miracle. Mm-hmm. But his, his miracle at the cross, didn't even, or in the resurrection, it didn't start at the cross, um, and it didn't even start necessarily in the Garden of Gethsemane, in his prayer life. But it started all the way back in heaven with his relationship with God Mm -hmm. and who he saw God to be, right? And he took that and he brought that down when God had him come down to earth, right? Um, But what we do see is that out of that relationship that he had with God, the most pivotal, I believe personally, the most pivotal point in Jesus' life was in his conversation with God before he went to the cross, Mm -hmm. which was, in fact, the Garden of Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to look a little bit at the Garden of Gethsemane because it wasn't not the Garden of Gethsemane that that prayer allowed him to act. Mm -hmm. That prayer allowed him to take action. So turn over to Mark 14. Mark 14, verse 32. Mark 14, verse 32. says well give me give me an amen when you get there first of all mark 14 you gonna amen me when we get there amen no amen the title of tonight's lesson you can title it a couple different ways you can title it grounded by his fatherhood um you can you can title it uh Prayers that create miracles. Whatever you want to do. 
have fun with that. Okay. Um, Chantel, can you help Ebony find, um, find scripture? Thanks. So Mark 14, verse 32 <clears throat> says, They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to, deeply, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. You ever been there? My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but you, what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Wow. Wow. I love that. Quick, quick, quick question for you guys. Just kind of a side note. Who is your betrayer? Who is your, who is your current betrayer? Wow. Who do you need to come up from prayer and be like, that's it. Rise, let's go. I got this. Okay? Is your betrayer your purity? Is it your hopelessness? Is it laziness? Your pride? Maybe your betrayer is lack of trust or disobedience. Jesus not only overcame his betrayer, but he overcame every betrayal after that because of his prayer life with his father. And it's just incredible that God led him to action to defeat once and for all what would otherwise put him to death spiritually. But it required that he put his betrayer to death. You see, Judas had the option to die himself, as Jesus would command, right? To die to yourself and deny yourself. He didn't choose that. He ultimately caused his own death. But in this passage, what's so incredible is that I want you to really think about this. Jesus put to death once and for all betrayal. Think about that. Betrayal would never, ever, ever have a hold on Jesus ever again. Even though we would betray him over and over and over and over again. How many times should we forgive our brother? Lord, seven times? No, not seven. Seventy-seven times. Perfection times perfection infinitely. Right? The scriptures tell us. Right? This is the kind of miracle that you can have when you pray the way Jesus prays. That you can put to death once and for all the insecurity about how you feel about your body. That you can put to death once and for all the hopelessness about feeling whole and complete. About knowing that you're loved and really believing it and being okay with that. Like, you can actually do this. Why? Because Jesus did this. And we follow him. And not only do we follow him, but if we are a disciple of Jesus, we have been baptized and we received in that moment the gift of the Holy Spirit, which gives us the power to tap into the exact same power as the scriptures tell us that rose Jesus from the dead. So if Jesus can once and for all put to death, his betrayer, why can't you? Wow. Wow. Why can't you? It's because we don't pray like him. Wow. Have you ever had a moment here where, like Jesus, where you're just like, you're feeling a lot? 
You used to straighten up. And like, as my husband says, you are on, you're watching the pilot. And yet, your heart just went straight over to season six. Right? Like, something's going on right in front of you. And then you're like, you played it out six years down the road. And you freaked out. Right? Season six. We call that up in here. You went straight season six. <laughs> you just let your emotions go. Right? Who's on season six? You know what I mean? Like, I love her to pieces. Evelyn was like, girl, I'm on season 11 over here. I need some help. You know what I mean? And I just super appreciate her heart. She's like, I was on season 11. <laughs> I love her. She gets over like that. But, I mean, he was going through a lot. He was distressed. He was troubled. He was overwhelmed. He was full of sorrow to the point of death. Mm. Have you ever had that kind of a time? Yeah. That kind of a moment? Yeah. You're just like, okay, God. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't. Uh, I got nothing. I don't even see the path forward. But it's funny because Jesus was like, I see the path forward. You ever been like that where you're like, I see the path forward, but um, for real? <laughs> like real these. Like are we talking like real these, like this is the path forward you want me to take? Like me. Like you want me to. Wait, so you're... Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Right? Right? Um, and, uh, and you're just like, okay, really this path? Or just, you're just super sad or angry or you're up in your feelings, right? And you just can't get past them, right? You ever see little kids? You're asking them how they feel. I'm mad. Okay. So why are you mad? I'm just mad. Uh, yeah. I don't know why I'm mad anymore. I've been mad for so long. Oh right? Some of us are like that. Yeah. We're like, I'm just bitter. I don't even know why I'm bitter. I've just been bitter for so long. Or like, I'm hopeless. What are you hopeless about? I don't even know anymore. Yeah. Right? Because you, you don't have a prayer life that helps you rise and defeat your betrayer. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and it's crazy because we have these difficult times in our life, and we're like, how on earth is this going to work? Mm. Right? How am I going to make it through this? And I think... Honestly, sometimes we look at the path and we're like, okay, I see the path. But what I don't see is what the other side looks like. Yeah. And so because I don't see what the other side looks like, um, is it going to be bright and shiny? Or is it going to be just as dark as I feel now, but I just got to go through the rest of this hardship? Dang. Right? And so you're going through this hard time and you think to yourself, okay, right? Because in here we all love God. And so <clears throat> we think to ourselves, okay, hard time, got it. Pray. I got to pray. So you're like, okay, I got to pray. So you start praying, and you're like, God, help me! <laughs> right? <laughs> and then you remember that somebody told you, like, that you need to be thankful. And so you're like, and your prayer changes to, like, God, thank you for the trees. Thank you for the birds. Thank you for my life. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my kids. Uh, and God, help me! <laughs> right? And maybe you end up, like, a little bit happier, like, circumstantially, like, in that moment. You're yeah. like, okay, you know, blue skies and rainbows, you know what I mean? Um, but, but the reality is, is it, it doesn't produce a lasting change or resolve in your yeah, heart that's true. about that situation. Mm-hmm. And you definitely don't end where Jesus did. Yeah. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Mm-hmm. I got this. You know why? Because God's got it. Because God's got the plan. And if my God's got the plan, it doesn't matter if I got to blow trumpets around the city and expect some walls <laughs> to fall. I'm good. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, instead, you, you end up like a wet noodle, right? Not a wet noodle. A wet noodle, right? Um, you're like wet noodles, right? Like they, like they stick to anything. Like mm. you, you throw it on the refrigerator, it's like... <sighs> Right, and it slowly falls to pieces, or like a wet noodle, like is is easy, easily malleable to whatever comes in its path. So you like you rise with conviction, and then somebody you're you're like, do you want to come to church? And they're like, no. And you're like, oh my god, Jesus isn't real. You know what I mean? Like, right? Like you're you're like a wet noodle, right? You're like, I'm gonna trust. And then somebody borrows your toothbrush without asking. You're like, I'm never trusting again. Oh, is that a thing? You know what I mean? It's not a thing. Don't make it a thing. Please don't make it a thing. Um, but you know what I mean? You, you end up like a wet noodle. Um, but, but you, and you just keep praying. 
about it over and over again. So you pray about it, and then you rise. You know resolve. You're circumstantially happy. And you pray about it the next day, and you're like, yeah, and you rise. But you're not, you just don't really believe it. And then you pray about it, and then you rise. And then you just, the next day, you just pray about something else. And then a week later, you remember you're supposed to pray about that. Oh. Or a month later, you remember that that thing's in your heart, and it's dormant, and it's rotting away at your flesh. And you're not dealing with it. So there. Yeah. I've been there, guys. This is the only reason why I can speak to this. <laughs> it's because I've, I've, I've been there. Right? And then month after month, you watch it slip farther back in your heart and you just grin and bear it. And you try to figure it out. You try and figure it out with action, even. But you don't have the faith that God hears you or even cares or will even do anything. Which goes in complete opposition to the scripture, 1 Peter 5, verse 7. Yeah. What does 1 Peter 5, verse 7 say? I'm glad you asked. It says, and everybody should write this passage down. You should memorize it. You should know it. It should be engraved in your soul. Mm -hmm. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 7. Right? Flip past Hebrews. 1 Peter's there. Right? 1 Peter 5, 7. So cast some of your anxieties. Mm -hmm. No. No. Cast just the anxieties on the Lord about, like, seeing other people uh, become disciples, uh, seeing other people grow, seeing other people's prayers answered. Cast those anxieties. <clears throat> no, all anxieties. Cast all your anxieties on the Lord. Um, well, because why? Well, because if you get better, you can be a better worker for him. Because uh, if, you, if you get better, if you're not anxious, then you can be a nicer person. Why? 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 Why should we cast all of our anxieties on the Lord? Because he cares for you. Period. End of story. As a parent, you know what? You know what? Like, I want, aside from my children becoming true disciples, you know what I want most of all? Is for them to always be honest with me. I always want to know where they're really at. Even if, if, even if where they're really at is my fault, I want to know. I want to know why they're where they're at. I want to know what they're thinking. I want to know what they're feeling. Why? Because I care for them. That's why. That's why. And if I don't know what's going on in their life, I can't help them. Right? And let's just be said of the church, too. I feel the same way about you guys. Right? I can't solve all your problems. But I can at least know what's going on so that I can pray for wisdom and pray for you guys to solve them with God. Right? Like, God actually cares for you. Why did my dad make me roll out from under, underneath that horse? Because he cares for me. Why did he make me get back on the horse? Because I need to learn to grin and bear it and, if, and I'll be a tough daughter. No. Because he didn't want me to live in fear. Because he cares for me, right? So it, it's incredible because in God's great love, even though we'll pray and we'll pray and we'll pray and it slip away and it'll slip away, what will happen is that in God's great love, he'll bring it back up again. The pain that you experienced from a breakup, the lie that Satan told you about that, He'll bring it back up again some other way. Yeah, you'll be betrayed some other way. So true. And you'll keep getting betrayed until you learn how to deal with betrayal. Yes. Right? People will break your trust until you learn how to trust in God. Talk about it, sis. Right? Until it, it doesn't matter on your heart anymore. Yeah. Until it becomes a thing where you're like, wow, they are hurting so much that they did that. Versus, wow. I'm such a horrible person 
wow, this is going to affect me for the rest of my life. It should affect you for the rest of your life, but not the pain, the resolve. The pain shouldn't affect you for the rest of your life, right? It's when you go to God and you're like, okay, I'm going to change the way I see this, right? I may have been betrayed, but you know what? I got, I got God and I can handle this, but she doesn't. She's going to betray other people. Why? Man, she needs, she needs Jesus. Yeah. He needs Jesus. He needs to know. He needs to know. He doesn't have to live like this anymore. That make sense? And so in God's great love, he will bring these things back up through some other way, some other situation. And then year after year, we either have an aversion to this space in this thing that we've lost heart in, or we start to conquer it. Right, mm. and and I love this. I just I love this about Jesus in this passage. Just rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Right, because what God wants for us in our times with Him isn't to be like, thank you for this, and thank you for this, and thank you for this, and I have this problem. If in case you want to deal with it, that'd be great. Right, uh, in our conversations with God, He actually wants to breathe life into us. Our prayer times should be life filling. You shouldn't feel like walking death, walking away from a prayer, right? Or you shouldn't feel like you just got your, your pick-me-up from Starbucks that only lasts until it becomes lukewarm or your belief in what God showed you becomes lukewarm, right? Um, but it, what's, what's, it's just so, it's so incredible. And um, I forgot to write down the scripture. I can't remember where, the, where this is, you guys. But some, in some version of the Bible, in some verse 63, in some book, I don't know where this is at, it, it says, the spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and of life. I need to find that passage for you guys. But the spirit gives life and the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. So when... When Jesus would talk to, to God, he would be full of spirit and life. Wow. He's life-giving, right? Yeah. So we need to fight in our times with God to leave his presence full of life, not full of flesh, full of faith, not full of fear. What are not just action that dies with our emotions, but convictions that last because we know our God. Yes. Right? So how do we get there? Well, in verse 36 of the prayer, Jesus says something profound in Matthew 26. Before he even starts to address his situation, I don't know if you guys caught it. He says, Father. That's it. He says, Father. Well, Ariel, that's what I do. I mean, like I say, Father. Hi, Dad. Hey, God. Right? It's me again. Yeah. Um, Isn't that what Jesus taught in Luke 11, verse 2? When you pray, say, Father. Well, if if that's what we're doing, then why are our prayers powerless when we approach the most powerful? Why do our prayers leave us empty when God says we're supposed to be full? And why do we have more questions at the end of our prayer when he says that he will make himself known to us? Wow. Because we're praying wrong. Yeah. Wow. Okay. We're praying wrong. Jesus told his disciples how to pray, and it was because the way they were praying was also wrong. It was wrong in order to bear fruit. It was wrong in order to have an intimate time with the Father. It was wrong in order to rise up from prayer, resolute, set on conquest for God, assured, and without wavering in whatever it was that he showed you, confident to go, obey what he asked. Yes, most of us do not rise up from prayer, resolute, to act. But Jesus did. Jesus rose up. His prayer was a conversation that left him changed, and it should leave us changed as well. Wow. And so we got to get rid of these prayers. Hi, God. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. And by the way, I have a problem. Yeah, that's right? like me. Okay. And then we close with, um, 
In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> you know, it's so funny, you guys. I, I literally caught myself doing this, going, in Jesus' name, and I hadn't even talked about Jesus. Yes. And I, I was, and I remember, like, this was a couple years ago, I was like, in Jesus' name. And I was like, wait a minute, God. Wait, in Jesus' name. And I started thinking about the scriptures in Revelation. And I started to think about the way that Jesus was hysterical with his disciples. I started to think about how he told them they were so dull. I started to think about, like, how he was like, guys, I saw Satan fall from heaven. That's adorable that people believe you. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, whoa, like, this is the Jesus that I'm saying in his name, amen. Yes. You know what I mean? And so, so, you know, although, like, all the ways that we pray is not bad, it's just very elementary. It's very elementary. And we have to start somewhere. But we must quickly grow in our understanding of what the scriptures and what Jesus is really asking of as a prayer. And oddly enough, it's not taught in the Bible to pray, Father, thank you for this, thank you for that, thank you for this, thank you for that. It does say to enter his course with thanksgiving. But it's not teaching us to pray this way explicitly, and there's some context to be considered. So let's take a look at that passage. Psalm 100. Psalm 100, verses 1 through 5. I love this. And it says... Shout for joy to the earth. So Psalms, in case you're trying to find it, it's, if you open up the middle of your Bible, it's probably right about the middle of your Bible. It's Old Testament. Just try and flip to the middle of the Bible. Psalm 100. And if you're sitting next to somebody who's flipping, please help them. Right? Um, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his people. We are his. We are his people, his sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give him thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Okay, hold up, Ariel. Like he just said all about like enter his courts with thanksgiving. We need to start with the thanksgiving. We need to do this with the thanksgiving. Ah. But check out verse 5. It says, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Yeah, it tells us to enter his courts with thanksgiving, but why? Why do they do that? Because the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all three generations. So prior to thanking him, their hearts were already set and convinced on who he is. Their hearts were to be set on God's character, his character of goodness, enduring love, which means long duration, perpetual, continuous existence, and his faithfulness to us, which then produces this kind of outpouring of thanksgiving. So their knowledge and conviction of his character created in them a heart posture that poured out thanksgiving. But it's not telling us to make thanksgiving our first focus. The word in verse 5, 4, means because or it is a fact that. So you grammatically could put this and contextually could put verse 5 at the top. And one would say, because it is a fact that the Lord is good and his love endures forever, his faithfulness continues through all generations, shout for joy to all the earth. Enter his courts with thanksgiving and praise. This is why they did this. This is why Jesus did this. Because they were convinced of who God is. They got it. Back then, they wouldn't refer to God as Father, but they would understand and focus on his character. And in the New Testament, Jesus taught us to look at God with so much more great intimacy. Interestingly, though, this idea of having a conviction of God's character in the Old Testament was actually additionally taught by knowing his fatherhood in the New Testament. So if we really want to pray the way the Bible tells us to pray and then see the kinds of change and miracles that prayer produces, like Jesus facing the man who betrayed him and coming up from resolve, from prayer, to die a horrific, intentionally humiliating ex execution. Yes. And to do so with resolve, meaning steadfast surrender and determination, of knowing his father had not just a plan, but the plan, and the right plan, and a good plan. And he did this without resentment, 
without fear, without cowardice, without doubt, without, but with instead strength, determination, and a willingness to go through anything. So we must consider how we pray. Well, how should you pray? You should pray with your father's character at the very center, the very core of what you pray. So let's take a look at Jesus' advice. And actually, it wasn't even advice. It was direction. He says in Luke 11, so let's go to Luke 11. What's this? In Luke 11, so in the New Testament, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke 11. Verse 2, he says, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. And then he goes on to talk about being tenacious in prayer, verses 5 through 8. Being bold in prayer, verses 9 through 10. And being expected in prayer, verses 11 through 13. But all because he understood the heart of the Father. My first point is Father the Nourisher. Wow. That word Father, we know that Father is Abba. That word, maybe you don't know, but now you do. That word Father here means Abba. And what was so incredible about that is that the Jews would pray to God Almighty and there was a distance. We know that. Some of us know that. Mm-hmm. But this is an intimate name. It is the most intimate name, Father. Mm-hmm. Why is it important to know this? Because he is setting the disciples up to go, guys, you can't talk to, to, to the Father like he's a priest or a, a rabbi or a, you know what I mean? Like, he's not, and, he, and he's not way over there. He is the creator, but he's not way over there. And yes, he is master and he is sovereign, but he's not way over there. Mm. He's close. He's intimate. Right? And here is my, what's really cool, you guys, is I I love, if you guys want to get some good Bible study, check out blueletterbible.org. Blue Letter Bible is really cool. It's an online version of the Bible, but what I love about it, is it takes the original text and it'll tell you what that word specifically means in the original in its original meaning. And then it will show you other passages where that same word is used or variants of that word is used and you can see how God is moving this word around the scriptures. Think about that. God is moving this word around the scriptures because he wants you to get that whole context. But this word here, Abba, Father, quite literally means Nourisher, protector, upholder. So when Jesus commanded his disciples to pray this, it was more than just intimate relationship. It was more than just Abba. He says, when you say Father, in your heart, in your soul, in your being, everything that you think about, you need to be going, Father, my nourisher, my protector, my upholder. That's what he was saying. This is the heart of God. This is the very essence, the very character of God whom you're praying to. Isn't that incredible? Check this out. So, so what, is it, what does it actually mean? Well, so um, the word in Greek is pater, P-A-T-A-Y-R with a, a hyphen. But what's really cool is if you think about, so then you look at that word nourisher and you look at not the definition online, but actually the definition, the biblical definition, it means to sustain with food or or nutriment, supply with what is necessary for life, health, and growth. It also means to cherish, foster, keep alive. And it also means to strengthen, build up, or promote. 
So when you're praying, this is what this is this was Jesus, this is what he was talking to Jesus about. When he was like, Father, Abba, do we gotta do this this way? He was like, Father, you're my sustainer. You supply everything that is necessary for my life and my growth and my health. Father, I know you cherish me. I, I, I know that, that you alone keep me alive every single morning. Father, you strengthen me and you build me up. You have promoted me and lifted me up. And all of that is just a portion of what he meant when he said Father. Wow. What do you mean when you say Father? Is it like, dear hiring committee, comma. <laughs> Dear scholarship committee, comma. Is father just a salutation? A greeting? Wow. Or does it mean this? Because if it means this, then this is what gave Jesus the incredible power to rise and conquer his betrayer. Because when you believe this about your God, when you believe this about your father, that he's like, that you know he wants to keep you alive and breathing because he's got a plan for your life that's beautiful, excellent, and amazing. When you know that he promotes you, he celebrates you, that the angels literally stand up and rejoice over you. Yes, they do. Right? Like, this is, this is your God. This is, this is your father, right? This is your father, the nourisher, right? Right? And there is, there is a woman in the Bible who I love, and she's in 1 Samuel. Let's go there. Mm-hmm. Come on, there you go. And she, like, it just shows who God is in this, in this passage. <clears throat> love this. It's part of your, it's going to be part of your homework, actually. Oops. First Samuel. Um, (laughs) And we're going to pick it up. First Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. It's at the beginning of, um, it's towards the beginning of the Bible. Um, First Samuel chapter 1, verse 1 says, There was a certain man from Ramathaim, a Zufite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jerom, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Ziphu, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peniah. Peniah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Wherever the day Whenever the day came for Elkaniah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Peniah, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, to Hannah he gave a double portion, because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting there on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. 
And she kept on praying to the Lord Eli, uh, to the Lord. Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord. Hannah replied, I am a woman who is deeply troubled. Sounds like Jesus. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked for, asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. I love that. She believed even before anything happened. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord, and then went back to their home in Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. Wow! I, I, I just, I love, I, like, how can you ever read that passage and not just read the whole thing? It's just, it's right there. Like, I love it. You know, and and many times, like, we've read this, we've analyzed um, Hannah's prayer. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at God's heart. I don't want you to look at Hannah's prayer. I want you to look at God's heart. Oh, wow. Where was God the nourisher in this setting? Where did he supply her what was necessary for life, health, and growth? Where did he show that he cherished her? That he kept her alive, that he strengthened her, that he was there to build her up, and he was there to promote her. Where did he do that? Well, didn't her husband give her double portions? Yeah. Didn't her husband make it obvious to her that, she, that he loved her so deeply? Her husband was trying. God, I believe God was using her husband to show her, look, I, I do see you, but she couldn't see it. Right? She couldn't totally see it. She was, she was well fed. She was taken care of. Right? She was kept in, in a, a good place to live. God was taking care of her. And he was nourishing her heart. But I don't know if she saw it. And the reason I don't think she saw it was because she said, Lord, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me. She wanted to know that God saw her. And God's like, I've been keeping you alive. I've been letting your husband give you a double portion. I see. But she didn't know that he saw her. She didn't know that he was nourishing her. Point number two. Father the protector. Biblically, in that space father, that we're looking at in Luke 11 verse 2, that word father, the piece about protector, the biblical definition, a, a person or thing that protects. Thank you for that. A defender, a guardian. Okay. To defend or guard from attack, invasion, loss, annoyance, insult, cover, or shield from injury or danger. To guard from competition. Wait, 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 Ariel. No, 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 no. God didn't do that here. She was being provoked. She was being insulted. God did not protect her from that. Really? Really? She may not have seen it. It says, year, it says that um, her rival pr- provoked her in order to irritate her. And this went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. 
And yet again, her husband saw her. Why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? There could have been a lot more that was done to Hannah at the hand of her enemy. But did he protect her? Did he guard her? Absolutely. He was there. God was there. He knew what was going on. He knew what was going on the whole time. And God's defense of her was not readily seen. Because do you think that God did not know? Do you think God did not know that this was going on? God told him. But he was waiting for her heart to get there. Because what did he need? God already had planned out that Hannah's boy was was going to be Samuel. He'd already planned it out. He already planned it out. Think about this. Peniah's sons were not promoted to the level that Samuel was. Samuel was dedicated to the Lord. To have your son in that space to be dedicated to the Lord is a step below becoming king. Kings listened to prophets. Not the other way around. So was she guarded? Was she defended? Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. She was, she was not physically harmed. Insults, yeah. But you know what else? It didn't destroy her soul. Oh, it caused her some grief, but it didn't destroy her soul. So we see God protecting her, guarding her, aware of the situation, preparing her, preparing her heart so that he could what? So that he could be the father that would uphold her cause. Point number three, father the upholder. The upholder means to support or defend as against opposition or criticism. To keep up or keep from sinking. To lift up and to raise. Samuel was dedicated to the Lord. I would say that that was God upholding her cause. Like, he was like, I mean, just think about it. Like, you ever have a situation where somebody's talking trash on you? And uh, you really want to talk trash back? Oh, yeah. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Some of us probably did, you know, in our former life. I'm sure it was only in our former life. <laughs> <laughs> Never in our head or out loud as a disciple. Amen. Um, and, and you just, like, you just want to talk trash back. Right? And you're like, I can't say anything. And you say nothing. This happened to me, guys. It was actually pretty awesome. Um, I was a disciple, and I was, I was working for a company, and um, I was a consultant, and uh, the boss was grooming me, the owner of the company was grooming me to be her next up and coming, whoever. And, um, and my clients really, really liked me. They really liked what I stood for. Um, and I would, I would, anytime I'd work with a client, I would always say, I've got three tools. I could teach you from the tools of business, the tools of psychology, or the Bible. Which can I use on you? I do this professionally. And they're like, most of the time, I think of only a couple times where they preferred business and psychology over the Bible. And these are just random people. This is like Exxon, Chevron. Like, I counsel for uh, school boards, I counsel for oil, co- oil and gas, I counsel for real estate development firms, I counsel for, like, there were so many different, like, it touched everything. It was really cool. And so, um, yeah, it was just really cool, but, um, and I consulted for them, and on leadership development, business strategy, blah, blah, blah. But they really liked what I was doing. And when I couldn't do something because I didn't know, I would tell them. And I, I kept having these CEOs come to me and go, Ariel, like, 
can I, like, I, I, I want what you have, I want what you're teaching, I want to know, like, not scriptures, but I want to know how to rate, how to do my business and do it the way that you're doing, because I love the way you lead, I love the way you're telling me, and I would, call, like, guys, like, one after another was, like, there, like, I remember this one guy specifically, he came in, he was, like, look, here's the deal, um, I know that I have, like, a contract of, like, you know, um, I'm paying for set services, he's, like, but, would you be willing just to take a blank check and just run this all the way through my company, what you're teaching me? Basically, he was like, I'll give you carte blanche. This is what my company needs. I took that back to my boss. She was fired up. Took the next time that happened back to my boss. She was fired up. It kept happening. Stuff like that kept happening. And she became really upset. She got really afraid that I was going to take over her company. Oh, yeah. And um, I, I didn't know. I had no idea. I was, like, clueless. I'm, like, I'm just, like, I'm taking it back to you. I don't really care. Like, <laughs> like this is really cool. This is great for your company. I didn't care. It was not my thing. I didn't really care. And um, anyways, so long story short, a lawsuit. I got terminated. There ended up being a lawsuit against me for trying to steal her clients. No. Everything in me wanted to just go into that office, talk to my coworkers, and be like, look, here's what's really going on, guys. Here's what was said. Here's why it was said. Here was the context. Here was the da 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 oh, yeah. Everything in me. I was like, Whew, not going to do it. And I remember distinctly praying. I was on a phone call with the judge. We were taking testimonies. And she was there. He was there. Um, and we were on a phone call because there was a lot of snow. It was in Alaska. Um, and, uh, and I remember him asking for her testimony, and she said all these crazy things. And, and I remember the judge, he said, um, and, and I gave my, um, well, no, she said all these crazy things, and I gave my testimony, and, then, and he goes, um, do you have anything that you would like to add or... You know, any last thoughts that you'd like to give me? And I remember in that moment, like, I literally remember just praying and going, do I say anything? God, what do you want me to say? And because it was looking pretty bad. And, um, and I, just, I just told the judge all I could think of as I prayed. And I just told him, I said, you know what? I'm not going to pretend to know the law better than you do. And you've been doing this a lot longer than I have. So whatever you think is fair or right, whatever your final judgment is, it's fine. And it came back that actually she needed to pay me. <laughs> oh, wow. dang. Oh, my God. But that's what happened to Hannah. Because the Lord upheld her cause. When I was going through all that, I didn't see. I didn't see everything. I got kind of caught in my emotions and I'd pray, but I wasn't totally like, okay, God, you got this. You got me? Because you got me. We got me. We good? We good? Right? And, and kind of like Hannah, I was like, man. I'm getting annoyed. I'm being insulted. Like, right? Mm. But you know what God, the protector, the father protector, he also guarded her from? He guarded from her not believing in him anymore. Wow. He guarded her heart from not thinking that he was there anymore for her. You know how many women in this situation would be like, fine, you know, like, Seriously? Like, I, I can't. there are tons of women. They're like, I can't have kids. God, why? Have you forgotten me? Yeah. Like, you know what? I, I'm just, I'm done praying. I've prayed about it for so long. Forget this. Yeah. Not her. God protected her heart. God was her defender and her guardian. He kept her heart from becoming so hard that she would turn away and follow the same behavioral patterns that Penaia did. So yeah, did he protect her? Absolutely. 
Mm. He protected her heart from getting so hard that she would turn away from the living God. So sometimes God's protection comes in ways that we don't think. We think God's protection, like my dad, when he put me back on that horse, why are you putting your 10-year-old kid back on the horse? That horse is crazy. The saddle doesn't work. And, like, she just had to roll off. It doesn't make any sense. It makes a lot of sense. Because my father protected my heart from living in fear. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. It's so cool. But we also see here that he, he upheld her cause. He lifted her up through lifting up her offspring, right? And it was just so, so incredibly cool. So we see in, in the story, and there's so much more that we can look at in Hannah's story about this idea of who's God the Father, right? Because when you pray <clears throat> to this dad, to this God, to this father, it'll change your life. And so I'm going to give you guys the same challenge that I gave a couple of sisters four weeks ago that they have been having a lot of fun with. It's been really hard for them. I'm going to give you guys the same challenge. For the first five minutes of your prayer. I didn't pray for five minutes, Ariel. Perfect. Now you will. For the first five minutes of your prayer. All I want you to pray about is the fatherhood of God. And then pray through the rest of Luke 11. Time yourself, quite literally. Set your timer. Can you do this? I know that you can but you're going to see how much you don't do it, how much you don't think about it. Because when you start to, and I, you guys, this was me. I was like, God, you're my protector. And I'm like, wait, but now, I, okay, wait, I've said it already. Okay. All right. And I'm like, wow, have you protected me? Wow. Father, there were power lines down today. And there were trash cans blowing across the road. And, and like, you knew I had to get from point A to point B. And, like, you protected me from all of that. Yes. Right? Father, like, this, this sister who usually comes at me, Ooh. she prayed to you today. And you protected me from getting the shrapnel from it. Oh. And, and I see that. And you, you really protected me. Right? God, you, you've nourished my soul. Because you showed me my sin today. And because you showed me my sin, it can't kill me anymore because I'm going to repent. Father, like that, like you've nourished me by keeping me alive spiritually over the course of decades when I wanted to give up. Right? Father, you've protected me time and time again from insult and injury. You've upheld my cause. You've had other people talk about me so that I didn't have to defend myself. Mm -hmm. Right? You've kept me from injury and danger when, man, I did some stupid stuff throughout my life. Right? You've upheld my cause. You've lifted me up even when so many other people said there's no way she'll never come back from that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, five minutes. Just talk to God about who he is. About who he is. And who he has been in your life. Specifically as a father. Right? And if you have a hard time with it, here's your second challenge. For the next two weeks, because we're not going to get together again for two weeks, in this manner anyway. I want you to, as you go through the Bible, I want to encourage you find different women in the Bible. Ruth, Esther, Lydia, even go back through Hannah. Right? Um, you can even look at some crazy women, like Jezebel. Yeah. <laughs> because just because we don't obey, and just because we're dumb, doesn't mean that God still isn't trying to protect, uphold, and nourish. Mm-hmm. You can look at Mary. 
You can look at the, the bleeding woman. You can look at the woman at the well, right? Like there's so many different women that you could look at. And look at their story. And then ask these three questions. How did, God, how did you protect her in this situation? How did you nourish, where, 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 is, where is your nourishment in this situation? Where did you uphold her in this situation? Because you know what it's going to cause you to do? It's going to cause you to look in other places in the Bible to see where that happened. Mm. Right? The, being, the beginning of Esther, right? I'd be like, what? I don't understand why. I'm like this kid, happy-go-lucky, and now you put me in this whole place where there's a bunch of these concubine, naked women trying to get all cleaned up for the Lord, and, or not for the Lord, but for this king. they like, I don't even know this king. Like, I don't want to be here. I like my life. Now I'm put on a pedestal, and now I'm having to have people, like, to give me a bath. This is Weird. Weird. I would, I, that, would, that would be my response, you guys. I would not be fired up to be, like, figure out, like, I want to be one of the many wives of a king. Like, that would not be my thing. You know what I'm saying? But that, that's what Esther was thrown into. Right? I don't know if that was her heart. That would be mine. But ask yourself, how did, how did God, in these different situations, nourish, protect, and uphold? Right? And pray this way. This is why our prayer lives... Um, are not as strong as they could be. And this is just the first part. So you're going to chew on this first part. Yeah. You're going to learn this first part. Yes. Wow. For two weeks, you're going to figure out who God really is as your father. Yes. You're going to figure it out. You're going to see the way that even the dad that you struggle with forgiving, you're going to look at him now and go, wait a minute. I think I may have seen God's protection in that action. Any hole that somebody provided in your heart was a hole that God used to get you to him. Yes. Right? Yeah. Like we got to see God really who, for who he is. Because Jesus was not like, seriously, dad, the cross, for realsies? He was like, that's my dad. He would never put me through anything that's going to end up harming me. Yeah. Really harm me which is something that could kill the soul. Kill the body? Yeah, fine, sure. Yeah. But kill the soul? No. He knew he was coming back from that. He trusted his dad. Yeah. Do you know that you're coming back from whatever's betraying you? Do you trust your dad like that? Do you trust him? You're like, I'm coming back from this. I'm coming back from my hopelessness. I'm coming back from my impurity. I'm coming back from my discouragement. I'm coming back from my poor character. I'm coming back from this. Because my God says that I'm coming back from this. My father loves me that much. And he put me through this. Why? Because he wants me stronger. He wants me to be stronger so I can be stronger for others. So as you guys go about your life these next couple weeks, I dare you. I double dog dare you. I double dog dare, I triple dog dare you. No take backs, no repeatsies. Okay? Pray like this. Pray the way Jesus prayed. This is why he wasn't a wet noodle. First and foremost, he understood Father. Pray like this. You guys are going to see so many incredible things change. In how you view God, it will change how you rise up in prayer and it will produce the actions in you that will create miracles because you have absolute faith in his fatherhood. Amen? Amen.